super excited to be here. So my name is Andreas and I'm with uh, Western Digital and I'm going to talk about uh, work I've been doing on an NVMe driver written in Rust. So outline why are we doing this um, and then how are we doing it. Then I have some uh, benchmark numbers and a little bit of um, an outlook. So I think the there's no need to replace the current NVMe driver. It's a really good driver. Um, but it's a really, uh, in the NVMe uh, driver is a really uh, good target for, uh, for experimenting with uh, writing drivers in Rust. Because NVMe um, is relatively simple, at least when you confine it to the PCI transport. And um, we have really high performance requirements in the NVMe driver. And the, NVMe, the C version of the NVMe driver in Linux is super widely deployed. I'm sure that all of your Linux notebooks are running this code. And the implementation is mature and well optimized. So we can use that as a, um, as a, base, uh, as a baseline to benchmark the Rust work on. If we can do as good as the C driver does, then uh, we, uh, we have shown that Rust is uh, viable. And we have a diverse set of interfaces to play around with uh, inside the, um, the, uh, the space of the NVMe driver. So the plumbing, just a quick, uh, in case you're not familiar with NVMe, uh, NVMe is a, a storage uh, interface that uh, lets you talk to um, <laughs> some storage media. And the way you do that is with the uh, ring buffers that live, uh, for, at least for PCI, uh, with ring buffers that live in host memory. Um, so the way that wor it works is you have, a, you, have a, you have a management queue and then you have a number of um, IO queues uh, that, you can, um, that are not fixed up to some number uh, that the controller supports. You put a command in, uh, in a submission queue and um, ping the controller that you put it there then you ca the controller will pick this command and execute it and return a completion uh, in a completion queue on which you can opt to have a, an interrupt delivered or you can pull that queue. That's how you do IO with NVMe. The place we're gonna plug this in is in the bottom of the, um, of the kernel storage stack, which is uh, depicted here. So up top, we have some user space processes that are sending IO requests uh, into the kernel via some mechanism. And um, we have, a, uh, for the multi-queue um, system, we have some software queues per core for the device and a number of uh, hardware dispatch queues that may be less. And the bottom of these hardware dispatch queues is where we plug the, uh, the, the, the multi-queue device driver in for the NVMe. And so a high level overview, the way the kernel talks to the, uh, the multi-queue device driver is through the block MQ ops, which is a table of um, function pointers that the kernel will call to have the driver do various uh, things such as uh, queue requests or pull, the, uh, pull for completions. And I'm just gonna look into um, one of these, uh, okay, so just, on the left, we have a, a trait, um, which in Rust is kind of like an interface, uh, where we have for each uh, for each of the function uh, pointers in the uh, C table, we have a corresponding uh, more or less function in the, this trait. So the trait you implement for your own type and you sort of fill in the functions to um, uh, implement the API. And I'm just going to bring up now the queue, uh, queue request function, which corresponds to the uh, field of the same name in the blog MQ ops. So in here we have, um, we are passing in um, hardware data that is uh, private data per, that is per dispatch queue. We are passing in queue data that is private data that is per block device. And then we have the request itself. These are, uh, these fields must, uh, the first two fields must implement pointer wrapper, which is a, a trait we use for things, uh, Rust things that can become a void pointer and handed over to the C side. 
uh, and they come back as a, a borrowed version of that with uh, anonymous lifetimes on, which makes sure that we are not uh, leaking these references uh, somewhere we should not inside of our implementation. And uh, uh, the concrete implementation for the IOQ in uh, the NVMe driver looks like this. We're using um, uh, a box namespace for the queue data and a, a reference counted uh, NVMe queue for the uh, per dispatch queue um, structure. The ref uh, struct is a wrap around the kernel ref count T. And one more thing to mention is the, uh, we're using this uh, the macro, the Vtable macro, which lives in the, in the kernel, uh, Rust kernel, that will go in and pass uh, all of the functions that are in a, in a trade and emit a const bool, uh, boolean for each. So for the trade, when you annotate a trade, it will emit uh, this uh, bool to false. And then when you do it for the uh, implementation, this bool will be true in case that function is implemented. And we use that to decide whether or not to install a callback pointer in the, uh, in the function table that we pass back to the kernel. So in case you have a default implementation, you can just not implement the, um, the function and uh, the, the, the null pointer will be installed in the V table, in the, in the function pointer table. So, Calling this function that we have now implemented in our trade looks something like this. It actually looks exactly like this because I, I copy pasted it. Um, so this uh, QRQ callback will have uh, the will be exported as a C symbol, and uh, the types that we use in the in the function signature are from the uh, kernel C headers, and these are raw uh, raw pointers. So just to I can go through this. We what we do here is we unpack our request. Uh, so this this will the type of this will be a struct request, and we unpack our private data for um, for the uh, per, per, per dispatch queue data, and similarly for the uh, per device data. And then we just call into our uh, trade impl implementation here, and the lifetimes of these. Uh, were, um, Types here will be uh, actually be unbounded, but that is fine because once we call in, we uh, uh, they uh, mold into the anonymous lifetimes in the uh, function signature. So we and that's the way we're sure we are not leaking the references inside this function. Um, so this uh, is a is a not um, what do you call it a redacted thing that I put together to show what, what would someone do to implement an, a, a blog MQ device with the abstractions that we have. Up top are the wrappers that the kernel crate provide. provide. We have one for the tax set and then one for the blog MQ operations a, a trade. A, a user would implement um, this trade on some struct and uh, would provide a, a structure to use for the um, uh, per device uh, dispatch queue. And the way you tie it together is you create a tag set, you then instantiate your um, private data for the dispatch queues, as many as you need. And um, in the callback to the uh, map queues that you implement on your trade, you will decide how to dis distribute these queues across course. And then uh, in the end, you create a, a gen disk that we also have an abstraction for and add it, and then you're good to go. And by the way, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point if you have questions. And okay, yeah, benchmarks. So my system is a, a Dell PowerEdge with an epic CPU of, with the 16 cores, a lot of memory, and I have four disks in it, um, an uh, Intel Optane, three pieces of that, and then a Western Digital SN840. I'm running all of my um, benchmarks inside QMU with the KVM, and I enable two cores uh, for most of the benchmark inside KVM, sorry, inside QMU. And I pass in the disk with the PCI pass-through. Th so this figure uh, shows performance of IRQ-driven queues for um, 
in this way, in this benchmark, I uh, use FI, FIO that I bind to core zero, and I, I use a, a load, um, like a dummy load on, on, that I bind to the same core. So one core is busy doing IO, the other core is completely idle. And it, so in, in the first two columns, um, the, the FIO has the entire core. And we see that for uh, the SN840 drive, we do like around 700 IOPS. And for the uh, um, Optane drive, we do uh, twice that number. And the, you can see the C and the Rust driver uh, perform uh, quite similarly. One interesting thing to note here is that uh, in the case of the SN840 drive, the system is 95% loaded. Um, so 5% idle, 90% in the kernel. Over here we have a um, full system load, 95% in the kernel and 5% in user space. Uh, but we're doing twice the number of IO in the, uh, on the Optane drive. And the, the reason for that is we, we, have, um, we have fewer, uh, we, we enter the interrupt handler fewer times, we have much fewer interrupts. And when we do enter the interrupt handler, uh, because there are so much, uh, so much more throughput, once we have processed the completion, the likelihood of another one waiting before we exit the interrupt handler is higher. So because these uh, performed uh, so close to each other, I wanted to uh, like stress the system to um, see how they work in the limit. Um, and I, I didn't have any faster drive. So I, I thought I would do that with a, by, by putting some load on the cores. Uh, and the effect of that on bo both implementations are quite similar. So for pulled IO, the result is so for the IOQ driven, the C driver is a little faster, tiny, tiny bit. These results are not uh, statistic, statistically rigorous, so there may be some noise in them, um, but the C driver comes out a little better all the time, most of the time. For pulled, the results are more equal, uh, but it's a similar picture. Uh, and you, in this case, the uh, in the unloaded um, in the uh, unloaded system, the both drivers are able to push the the drives to their rated uh, specification. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for so I saw uh, I saw a guy on Twitter uh, with a fancy Dell system doing five million IOPS on one core on a, on a really expensive. Uh, <laughs> 15, pro probably not on one core. I hope not. Well, I want that core and I want that drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured maybe if I stack a few of these uh, drives that I do have, uh, I can uh, go, go up there. And so I went and, and plucked all my colleagues' drive and, and uh, put them in my machine. And... Um, for one, and so in this uh, benchmark, I do round robin IO, basically 32 IOs to the first drive, then the next drive, and then the next drive, um, and so forth. And for one and two drives, uh, the, the C and Rust drivers scale completely um, uh, linearly and identical, identically. But for three drives, the C driver performs um, two, I believe it's 2.6% better. Uh, and uh, so I've been sort of scratching my head as of why this is. Um, and I, one of the observations I have is that I have 60% uh, more level three cache misses with the uh, Rust driver. Uh, and the, co the kernel text segment is, is significantly larger. Um, but I, I, believe, I think there might be a lot of dead code in that um, text segment. Uh, and also I know that um, when, when, when we are calling into the uh, uh, kernel functions from Rust to activate something like a macro that we cannot generate binding for, what we do is we, we write a small C function and then we call that. And there's no LTO right now between the C and the uh, Rust sources. So I think that can also, uh, for uh, stuff in the hot loop and the hot path, there can be some uh, loss right there. Um, so I want to figure out how to enable that if that's possible. 
Let's see if this goes away. I have one more benchmark, which is just um, the same drives, the uh, Optane P5800, but then with the, I bumped the system to three cores and then scale horizontally. And they, that's completely linear scaling uh, and they perform identical. Uh, yes. Is that, is that the end of your benchmark? That's the end of the benchmarks. That's all the numbers I have. Uh, I might suggest Hello, check. Yeah, okay. So I might suggest running at lower depths because when you get that high a depth, you've saturated the device. And so if you run at a lower depth, then that's going to give you a little more idea of the software stack overhead. Yes, probably. Yeah. So in this, so the, uh, the hardware queue depth here is 1024, but the software queue depth is like 128. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying do. Do one, then do two, and then double. Okay, yeah, yeah, and then sure. just, just, just see what happens. Yeah. I think that would make a nice, interesting. Yeah, that's a good idea. Graph. Yeah. I'm guessing what I will see is I will see a lot of the uh, cost of entering the kernel uh, and not as much uh, of the cost of the actual hot loops in the driver. But I will try it for sure. Yeah. And yeah? Besides IOPS, have you tracked latency? Uh, I did not do latency tests at high throughput because the uh, overhead of actually measuring the latency is super high. So the throughput just went uh, down through the floor uh, because the, I'm not sure if it's just my VM uh, timer implementation thing. Uh, I have a power virtualized uh, timer clock source thing, but it was super slow. Mm. Uh working. I think so uh, why use a VM? Just run on the hardware and then run FIO, you'll get the latency uh, stats also. If I do run FIO on? Just don't run in a VM first, just run on the, the bare hardware uh, and uh, run FIO because you'll get the throughput and the latency statistics. I, I have, uh, yes, so I, I have a plan of um, to skip the VM, um, but uh, I mean, it takes, this server takes 10 minutes to reboot. So that's just me being lazy. I will do it. Um, running FIO also like calling get time of day or whatever clock source functions in um, the actual FIO is super slow. Uh, so when you have these super high throughputs, it just kills everything. Well, ask Jens, he has strict for that and he regularly pulls tens of millions of IOPS on his... I should ask him. He has a way of uh, getting things really fast. There, there's the right way to run that and should run that. Sure. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, I, I can disable them in the BIOS, I'm, I'm sure. I know, yeah. Which, which one? Yes, so the question was, the, the, it was a recommendation that on real hardware, you can also disable the cores. Uh, so enter the BIOS and, and disable some of the cores to have the same environment as in the VM. Just, so just the, the kernel boot parameter is enough. You don't need to change your BIOS. Yeah, just don't boot the cores would work as well. Just uh, want to get the credits uh, because uh, Wetson wrote uh, a lot of the code and I, I picked it up after him. And um, also, uh, I would really um, uh, um, welcome contributions and uh, comments on the code. I have put the links, the, the top link here is uh, for my uh, patches. It's on top of the, uh, the V9 patches. No, not the V9, but the Rust for Linux tree that was used for the V9 patches. So main or master or whatever. Uh, any feedback is welcome and patches are welcome. There's a ton of to-dos. So please don't hold yourselves back. Uh, so the, this driver is not production ready. It's a playground, uh, but I, I would like it to become more production ready. Um, so there's a lot of unsafe stuff still that I need to get rid of and, um, and, and uh, move into the proper place uh, where, it can be, uh, where it can live. There's no support for uh, removal, and uh, but teardown stuff is not, it's just absent, so I want to get that in. Um, and uh, I, I realized not having NVMe CLI is like super <laughs> not nice, so I want that, just plumb that in there. 
uh, and some other stuff. Um, and then, yes, uh, I want to uh, look into using the, um, so uh, Wilson talked about the uh, async, for those of you who are here before, Wilson talked about the async programming model and how that can help um, uh, um, make the code more readable for uh, asynchronous state machines in the kernel. And I would like to see how that, uh, what kind of performance I can get if I apply this in the, in the NVMe driver. And uh, I have a slide on that. I hope that's readable. So this is a simplified code for for um, the uh, queue and the complete functions in the uh, block MQ up ish trade that we have. Right now, what we do is we uh, when we get a request into queue, we map the uh, the uh, request data for the IOMMUs, and then we uh, submit a command to an NVMe queue. Uh, when we uh, when we get an uh, IRQ that something has happened on the queue, we process a queue and find a completion, and then we uh, use a tag set to find the completion, uh, or sorry, to find the request for that completion, and then we send that up the stack, and that eventually calls the complete callback to be uh, to be called by the kernel, in which we unmap the data and uh, and end the request. And so what what I would like to try is to. Um, basically slap these two together with async. And um, in this way we can, uh, I, th I think the code becomes more readable when we have the, uh, uh, when we have, instead of having the async stuff in different places, we can have it in a straight line code. And we can also uh, in a more neat way, tear down our memory mappings when, with a guard when this code goes out of scope. So the way we we would do that is instead of uh, instead of finding a a request, uh, we would find a, the task um, associated with this async function, and and then run that uh, in the uh, IRQ handler. One of the caveats with that would be that so what uh, the thing that happens when you do this uh, when you use this async await thing is that the compiler will split this function into two and implement the state machine for you behind the scenes. And that would cause the first part of this function to be in um, regular process context, I assume, and the other part would be in the, in the IRQ context. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if that is a, a giant foot gun waiting to go off or if that is something that's okay to do. Uh, and also I wanna figure out um, performance wise if this, uh, is, if this is cool. Because I think this pattern uh, is happening a lot of places in the kernel, and I think uh, the kernel could really benefit from um, something like this in general. Now here we slap two functions together, and maybe that's not a lot, but in general, I think it's uh, something to be uh, looked into. Yeah, so just to uh, sum up, we have an, a functional uh, NVMe driver uh, that performs uh, within a single digits, um, Close to the uh, C driver. It's not uh, production ready, but contributions are very welcome. Yeah. You see? Uh, that's all I have. So uh, go at it. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Matthew Wilcox, co author of the NVMe spec and uh, troublemaker who said you need to do an NVMe driver and, and, and then I'll believe that Rust is ready for use in the kernel. You have succeeded far beyond my expectations, uh, but both of you, all of you, thank you so much. You've done a fantastic job. I was not expecting to see these performance numbers. They are amazing. Thank you. Thank you.